Hey, everybody. And we had about 200 people register. Has anybody seen this app? I'm holding it on my phone, right? And I, you can tilt it and get the right degree. So is the roof on a 412 slope? I wanted to measure my table. Go across and go click the button and then go down. You can also take pictures of that. That's an app that I use, uh, inspection report app. So I'm gonna slide that over. I'm glad I can share that with you. And go to natchiorg slash everything. natchiorg slash everything. If you go there, there's 15 steps to become a successful home inspector. You should probably go through the first five because at that point you can start making money. But step one has a lot of resources for you. What we have is an, an online inspection community, the message board. You can meet thousands of inspectors there from all over the world. We have a mentoring program. These are certified master inspectors, internationally certified inspectors who have agreed to volunteer their time to help others. You can do ride-alongs. We have member chapters, no matter where you are on the planet. So somewhere in your area, there is an InterNACHI chapter, inspectorseek.com. These are InterNACHI certified home inspectors currently in business as home inspectors in your area. You have all these resources through InterNACHI. When you join InterNACHI, a whole world of opportunity opens up to you. For example, you're not alone. We have an online community. We have chapters. We have inspectors all over the place. And we have mentors as well. Um, Natchi.org slash everything is that website. All right, let's begin. Hi, everybody. My name is Ben Gromico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. And this is an InterNACHI webinar at natchi.org slash webinars. N-A-C-H-I dot O-R-G slash webinars. And our webinars are free live, online, and open to everyone. And what we're going to do today is we're going to inspect this house. And this is InterNACHI webinar number 46 at natchiorg slash webinars. We had about 200 people register for today's class. Thank you for all be for being here. I appreciate it. Feel free to ask questions. And if you're not a member of InterNACHI, I have a couple codes for you if you're interested in joining for free. Now, if you're already a member or you were a member, this doesn't count. You have to be a brand new person, right? Just interested in what is this InterNACHI organization? Well, try it out and you'll have access just like every other member. We can give you one free month membership. You visit this URL, natchi.org slash trial, T-R-I-A-L, and enter the code Webinar month, one word. Now, if you'd like to join InterNACHI, same URL, natchi.org slash trial, get a 50% discount off your first year. All you have to do is enter the code webinar. InterNACHI School is the only home inspector college. So if you were thinking about becoming a home inspector and you're wondering, where do I get trained? Go to an actual home inspector college, internachi.edu. We're the only home inspector college accredited by a national accrediting agency recognized by the U.S. Department of Education. All other schools, they don't have the .edu. So go to a tuition-free online e-learning school, InterNACHI school, the only home inspector college. We're going to talk a lot about performing inspections, becoming a really great inspector. But if you don't have a website, if you're not marketing, then Really, that's a mistake. If you're a great home inspector, you have to tell other people. And the best way to market your home inspection business and your services in your area is to get a website designed exclusively for InterNACHI members. And we have an official vendor for inspector websites. And that's at natchiorg slash websites. That's Inspector Website Builder. Go to Google now, type in Inspector, website, builder. That's our partner. Let's inspect this house, okay? What we're going to do in the next hour or two, we're going to inspect this house. We're going to learn how a house works. We're going to find problems. We're going to follow a home inspection standards of practice. We're going to use inspection software. We're going to read the report. 
We're going to learn how to get certified. We can talk about business and marketing, which is a lot of fun. Feel free to ask questions. It's being recorded so you can watch later. Here is my daily routine. I want to share with you what my routine was. I was a home inspector for 12 years in southeastern Pennsylvania, suburbs of Philadelphia, about 250 InterNACHI certified home inspectors were all competing and we were highly successful. And one of the reasons we were successful was because of InterNACHI resources. I didn't have to do everything. I delegated down to InterNACHI resources to do stuff like the online inspection agreement, like the marketing. And also I learned how to manage our time. If you don't know how to manage your time, then you're going to have challenges in business because the general rule in business is you make money, you need to divide it by your time. When you are starting off as a new home inspector, you are the president, the CEO, the CFO, the, you're doing billing and taxes. You're also doing the inspections, right? You're doing the marketing or you're delegating to InterNACHI's marketing team to help you, but you're managing your time. If you make $500 in one day, but it took you 12 hours to make it, well, I think it's better if it took you only eight. How do you do that? One way to do that is to get really good at performing inspections efficiently. And you do that by managing your time. How long is it going to take you to do an inspection? that is priced so that you can make a great living as a home inspector and make some profit to have some fun. Pay the bills, sure, but make some extra money with that calculated profitable inspection fee so you can go on vacation and do good things in the world. Here's how I made about $500, $600 in a morning. And I did two inspections a day. This is just my morning schedule. So I leave the house early, 7 a.m. My first inspection is at 8. My second inspection is at 12 noon. So I've, that's four hours in between. So the time that it takes me to do a full home inspection with ancillary services has got to be less than that, right? And I do that in many ways using different tools, really good tools that are right here in my tool bag. We can go over them and software. Okay, so at 7 a.m. I leave my house and I'm back home before five. I get to the first inspection, which is scheduled at eight. My client is, is scheduled to show up at eight o'clock. I'm gonna get there early so that I can do the roof. I wanna inspect the roof. This is a system that I don't want to bring my client to. I don't ask my client to inspect the roof with me. If I get up on the roof or I'm flying a drone or getting my ladder, I don't want my client near me. It's too risky, too much of a distraction. They're certainly not going to get up on the roof with me. It's not safe. So I want to do the roof. That's one system. The exterior is another system, but that's one system for sure where I don't even need to bother the, the occupant or the listing agent, or the seller. And it's the first system listed in the Home Inspection Standards of Practice. It's the first system in my inspection report software. It's the first system in my home maintenance book that I give to my client. It's the first system in my inspection report. It's the first thing that I do. You do not have to do it that way. You can do whatever you want. A lot of, a lot of home inspectors start in the kitchen. They like to start there and then move on. A lot of home inspectors just walk through. Many great home inspectors just get a feel for the entire roof, exterior, and the interior. They walk around. They turn on lights and stuff. They just want to see every room and take a general. Yeah, that's one way of starting it. It's really up to you. You have to manage your time. Nobody wants to be at a five, six, eight-hour home inspection. At 8 o'clock, my client is going to show up. I've already inspected the roof. I'm going to have a 
a bunch of business cards ready, handshake, big smile, great first impression, hand out my business cards and explain who I am and what we're about to do. Because I'm in charge. I'm going to, I'm going to invite my client with me. My client does not tell me what to inspect. I'm managing my time. My client can follow me. First thing that's done is the roof. That's one of, well, nine systems, let's say. Depends on how you count systems. But let's say there's nine systems. That's I'm done. One ninth. Uh, a one out of nine is done. So I'm moving on. I'm going to tell my client what I observed during the roof inspection. Invite my client around the exterior. And then we'll go in. Usually, my client will ask a couple questions about the report and about what to do next. That's really what the agent is for. But I'll answer that. And then they want to go inside and take a look at what they're going to do with the kitchen, maybe some renovation projects, maybe some paint, some window blinds, some new carpeting or something like that. And I'm going to assure them that if I find something that they should see, I'm going to get them and they're not going to miss a thing. And they're free to walk around with me. I feel like I can be more efficient if my client is with me during the inspection so I can get through all of their questions. I don't want to be answering the phone or email or chat at night. I want to wrap this up and I'm going to do a really great inspection for my client. And here's the rest of my schedule from 8 15. For about mm, almost two hours, there's the heavy lifting, the HVAC, the plumbing, the drain waste vent, the water heating, the electrical, the structure. Those are difficult systems. And for every system, InterNACHI School, the only home inspector college, has various courses on each system. So you can learn how to inspect every system, everything in a home. You can learn how to inspect through InterNACHI. At 10 o'clock, I'm in the attic. And when, it, when it's about two hours into the inspection, a little bit over, I should be in the attic. And I'm thinking, this is really great. I'm managing my time. I want to make some money. I'm going to do well with my client. And I'm going to move through the rest of the house, which is essentially attic and bring it on down. Interior, including the bathrooms, maybe a, a garage, attached garage kitchen. 10, 15, I'm doing the interior, then the bathrooms, garage, oh, laundry, kitchen. And I like to end up in the kitchen. That's where I'm going to print out a summary so that my real estate agents can use their pen and paper and just scratch things off. Maybe write little notes or dollar amounts. And I'm going to have the entire inspection report available because I'm writing the inspection report as I inspect. I'm writing as I inspect. So let's see if I can do this again. Can I share my screen? Let's see if I can do this again. I'm gonna share my screen with you. If I can't, I apologize, but I think it worked last time. So I'm looking at my phone, trying to project. There it is, okay. I don't even know how that worked. Okay, so I'm gonna open up my Spectora app. I have measure right here. This is a measuring app. Um, I demonstrated it earlier before the webinar began, but now I can take a measurement of something like this table height or something. So there's the, the surface there and I push a button and there's a surface of the ground. That's about 30 inches. And then there's this, you can go over here and stretch it and go there. And that's like uh, 40 inches, right? That's good. So, you know, these are kind of neat. Um, apps that I have. And then there's uh, Spectora. I can open that up and I can do the roof, right? And there's the roof covering. And what I do is uh, I just tap and also take pictures. So I can take a picture and then I can just add that to the inspection report. And that's in the inspection report. And I inspected it from the ladder and I used a drone. And here's my drone here. We talked about that, my little drone. And Aaron actually has a course to help you take the FAA exam. And so, uh, you know, I saw cracked shingles and you can do a video or another picture. So 
picture there, add that to the report. And when I'm inspecting using software, I am uh, making sure that I don't miss a thing, right? And I have all these sentences, essentially, they're called narratives, written before, and they're, they're written previously, they're in my inspection report, and whatever I want to say that reflects my observations, I just click, right? You can also talk into the software as well, write things up. And when I'm done with that, then I inspect the flashing. This reminds me of what to inspect as well. So I have to inspect according to the checklist, and which is a reflection of the standards of practice. I have to cover the roof covering. I have to inspect the flashing, the plumbing vent pipes, the gutters and downspouts. And also, here's a little reminder, there are a couple of optional systems and components in this section that I could add to it. So it's customizable on the fly. The software is really good and helps me be efficient with my time. This. Software is really important. It's going to be one of the most expensive things you have to invest in, but it's worth it. Get good software. You can usually ask the manufacturer, the software provider, for a free trial. And on that natch.org slash everything page, there'll be a link to those software vendors that work with InterNACHI members. At 11 a.m., I'm finishing the inspection and I'm making about four, five, six hundred dollars because my base home inspection price is $396, but I'm adding additional ancillary inspections, such as WDO, or wood-destroying organism inspections, right? I'm going to look for things that eat wood. I'm also going to try to sell a mold inspection, or infrared inspection, or a sewer scope inspection, or a radon, or another ancillary, a pool inspection. So how I do that is I schedule a home inspection and at the time of scheduling, like if it's a, an online scheduling system on my website, I'll offer ancillary or additional services. And InterNACHI trains inspectors on additional certifications. So we have 60 additional inspector certifications. In addition to becoming a certified home inspector, you, be, you can become a certified inspector in something else. And there's many more things. Why would we do that? Why would a home inspector want to become certified to do pool inspections? Well, the pool probably needs inspected. If left go, every system in a home starts to deteriorate. So you need to tell your client that the first step in any home maintenance program to maintain someone's home. You have to uh, take a look at it. You have to check it out. And this is a great time during a real estate transaction to check other systems, not just the home, but maybe look for radon, an indoor air quality issue. Like I said, a pool inspection. And it's a great opportunity to make more money for your business. Additional revenue streams is a great way to increase gross revenue. Another way to increase gross revenue is to simply do more inspections. So this is my morning inspection. After I get paid at this first inspection, I'm driving on to the next one, which starts at 12 noon. In between, I'm driving, I'm eating, drinking coffee. When I get there early, I'll change my shirt, a little deodorant, mints, and I'm ready to go. So. As a home inspector, you can make a great living. And InterNACHI has those resources for you. The main point is to manage your time. Remember, it's revenue, divided, money divided by time. How long, and you want to increase gross revenue. We already talked about how to increase gross revenue. And you want to reduce your time. So you want to increase the, it's like a fraction. Like back, back in high school, mathematics. Numerator divided by denominator. Top number, gross revenue, divided by time. You want to shrink that time by becoming efficient with your time, by managing your time, like the schedule here, and delegating tasks to something else. 
to be successful in business, in any business, you have to have a system of processes in place where not just you can do it, but anybody you hire can do this. So you have a process of performing an inspection according to the standards of practice. You have a process for scheduling an inspection. You have a process for marketing, social media marketing. There's a process set up so that you can delegate things. When you get the process down, you can get it written down literally, and you're practicing it, you can then hand it off to someone else. You know what needs to be done, and you hand it up. And likely, InterNACHI resources, we have a lot of systems in place for home inspectors. You can delegate those tasks down to this. One of them is, I have mentioned before, the online agreement system. This is a system where you log in as a home inspector through your phone or your laptop, and you send an inspection agreement to your client. That client reads the agreement. You can see them reading it. It's time stamped. You can see them signing it electronically with their finger on their phone or, or on their computer. And it's time stamped and it's archived and it's managed through your dashboard. Internet G has a way to manage all of your clients and the legal documentation through the Internet G system when you join as a member. That's one thing you don't have to do. You delegate that down. Why? So that your bottom number on that fraction starts to get smaller and smaller. The more you delegate, delegation is the key to business success. And you delegate stuff like marketing, like a website design. Don't design your own website. InterNACHI -E has a partner that designs websites exclusively for InterNACHI -E members. Let's inspect this house. There's a lot to talk about even before we even start inspecting, right? And it starts with the standards of practice. Every great home inspector knows the standards of practice. Every great inspection is based upon a standards of practice. It is the foundation upon which to build a great home inspection service. The standards of practice tells you and your client what you're supposed to be doing during an inspection. What do I have to check? What am I not required to check? What do I have to describe? And what do I have to put in the inspection report? Essentially, according to the standards of practice, a home inspector is required to put in the report any defects that the inspector both observes and considers to be a major defect. We call it a material defect. If an inspector doesn't see a defect, it won't be in the report. And ins a home inspector is not responsible for finding all the problems in a home. A home inspector is only responsible for putting in the inspection report those defects that were both observed by the inspector and considered to be major defects. When you realize that as a home inspector, I don't have to find all the problems. <laughs> Becoming a home inspector and performing inspections is, is a lot of fun because there are things, there's a million things to see during an inspection. And most of the problems are hidden from view during a visual only home inspection. You can't see everything. So, what's the value of a home inspection? Oh, it's incredible value. There is so much value provided, incredible amount of information. That's essentially what a home inspector does. We provide information so that our clients can make great decisions. And that information can be, um, can be found and retrieved and gathered by a home inspector during a home inspection within a couple hours, put in a report and given to a client. It's very efficient. It's one of the most fun jobs I've ever had. And it's one of the incredible, valuable services that a homeowner could ever get for their home. 
every home should be inspected by a certified home inspector. It doesn't have to be during a real estate transaction. It should be part of a homeowner's routine home maintenance plan. That's how much incredible, good, valuable information a home inspection can provide. It all starts with the standards of practice. First system in the standards of practice is the roof. So let's inspect this roof. So I'm up on the roof. I like to get up on the roof, walk around on the roof, and I'm taking a look at the shingles. I'm looking for essentially damage, holes, cracks, missing pieces, something that wasn't installed correctly. Those are my feet. I love to put that picture in my inspection report and on my website. It's part of who I am. It's part of my brand. It answers the question, why should I hire you instead of the other inspectors, the other 249 inspectors? There's my hand. I literally get up close to every system and component so that I can explain I was there. I was taking a look at your roof. So I have a question for you. Let's see if I can do this. So for those who are attending the live class, you're probably looking at a poll. And the poll says, uh, it's not with a video recording, but I, we have a poll. For those who are attending the live class, and it says, is a home inspector required to walk on the roof according to the international standards of practice, the home inspection standards of practice by InterNACHI? And we're going to answer, and half of you, more than half of you are participating and answering. It looks really good. I can see we're going to end it in five, four, three, two, one. And let's share the results. And the results are really good. So most of you answered, 91% of you answered no. So a home inspector is not required to walk upon any roof surface, even if the roof surface is relatively flat and only 10 feet, 12 feet above the ground. Um, a fall from there can be fatal. So it's okay that you're not sure. We have a standards of practice that you can refer to. And you incorporate that standards of practice into your software. That's why the standards of practice is a good starting point for any home inspection. You incorporate that standard into your checklist so that you are following the standards of practice essentially when you are inspecting so you won't miss anything. So continuing with my inspection, I take maybe 40, 50 pictures of the roof. This is um, a skylight. I'm looking at the flashing area. I want to see if there's metal flashing, there should be metal flashing installed around the skylight for this roof. And I see it here, but there's heavily applied roofing sealant, tar, black sealant. It's temporary, right? Um, it's temporary. And that means like, if it's temporary, you need to be up here every year. And why was it installed? And so in a sloppy manner. You know, it was just gooped on. Probably there was a, a leak. Skylights are notorious for leaking. It's very difficult to get it just right. So it was only one side that was tarred up. So maybe the seller has some information that they could share with us. I don't know, right? This is the other skylight. I don't know what has happened in the past. Home inspection, we... It's only a snapshot in time on the day of the inspection. I don't know what has happened in the past. The, the occupant may know. This is the gutter shot. I like to take a picture of the gutter. There's some screens on there because there's a lot of leaves coming from the local trees landing on the roof. So these are pretty effective. They're, they're pretty good. Whoops. Let's get rid of this. That's my software. Anywhere that a roof intersects with something else, a skylight, a vent pipe, or a wall like this, I want to take a look at it. So right around here is a really great place. I can see metal flashing, but a lot of sealant, a lot of temporary, it's like a lot of bandages. 
It's just temporary stuff here, right? And I don't think this is installed well. You're not supposed to have a big piece of metal just lying on top of the shingles here. So this is a critical area, and I'm going to try to figure out where this area is below. While I'm on the roof, I'm going to take a mental shot and digital pictures, and then follow up by taking a look underneath it. I want to go above and then and below. All along here, there should be step flashing. The siding is the counter flashing. There's the step flashing. I can see it. That's good. And there's another step flash. That's good. Step, step, step. This is all good. This is not good. I can see metal was installed, but this is, and this is counter flashing, but it's just gooped with sealant. Um, there's probably a problem here before I can see some shingles improperly installed on top of the original shingles. See the rows of asphalt, three tab shingles, and then they put some shingles here and then some, they probably nailed it, right? And then gooped it with sealant and then it's not, there's an open edge. So they put this metal here <laughs> and then this is open. So they sealed that. It's just a big mess. All this really is not professionally done. And uh, it's not reliable. Now, is it actively leaking? No, it's not even raining today. But during a heavy rainstorm, it could leak. And this is the reason why. But a home inspection does not predict future events. So after this inspection, if it rains hard and it leaks around this chimney stack below it, I'm not responsible. As a home inspector, you're not responsible for future events. What are you responsible for? Putting in the report observed defects that were considered to be material, major defects. All right, so I'm looking around. I'm, I'm lifting stuff up. I like to get my hand in there. You wear gloves to protect yourself. I want to see that step flashing. I do. That's really good. But really, some of it is just not installed properly. But I'm, I'm kind of concerned. So I want to take pictures, try to explain the importance of flashing where a roof material intersects with a wall. This is a critical area. And it's so much fun to inspect because we know it's simple flashing techniques that diverts water away. It's not waterproof. It's just water resistant techniques. I think in the building code, it's, you know, it has to be designed to shed water away and divert it away. It's not waterproof right there. So moving on, I see a ridge vent. That's good. Roof vents. And there's drain waste vent. This is from the sewer system, cast iron pipe. Look at that terrible flashing. What is going on there? It's just sealed up. Just someone needs, you know, to like tighten things up around here. Or my client, I'm telling them the story of the roof. And my client knows now the story of the roof that this is not reliable. And during a, a heavy storm, this may leak water. Okay. As long as they know, as long as they understand, this whole area here needs attention. This one too. Look, the flashing, it's kind of hanging out on the ridge. This is a critical area where water puddles up right here during a heavy rainstorm. And we just don't know what's going on. But someone does. Someone installed this for a reason. So while I inspect, I think of this illustration that's available in InterNACHI's gallery of inspection illustrations. And InterNACHI members can download these illustrations. We have hundreds of them. This is just one of them. I think I drew it, actually. And it reminds me of uh, what I do during an inspection. Mentally, I'm thinking how water hits the building structure and is diverted away from the the building. You want water. Water is fantastic. It brings life, but man, it can destroy. Even in semi-arid areas, um, geographically, wherever your house is, you have to think about how water and sun and wind affects the building. And this illustration helps my client understand what I am trying to explain, that water, rain, needs to hit and divert and run off the building. So I'm while I'm inspecting, I'm looking at the roof, the ridge vent, the roof slope, the plane, the gutter edge, the eaves, the overhang, the siding, where the deck railing 
meets the wall, where the deck flooring meets the wall. How is it diverted away? Where's the light fixture? Is there flashing at the light fixture? How's the rest of the siding? Is the siding above grade? Does groundwater go into a drainage system at the foundation? Is this water sloped away? How's the site drainage? How are we managing water, diverting away and getting kicked out with the windows and the doors? This is what I'm doing. Maybe this is a, an exterior system, siding system that allows penetration of water, but it drains. There's a drainage plane behind. What about the flashing? Like with stucco, you really need good flashing techniques and sealant techniques with stucco, hard stucco. So this helps me inspect because mentally I've memorized this illustration, but it also helps me in my inspection report. My inspection reports are easy to read and clear to understand. I write, frankly, for a 10-year-old about rain and water. So there's a more vintage, a, a ventilation. There's a gable vent. So I'm going to go in the attic. Got some things to see. While I'm on the roof, I'm inspecting other systems. So I'm doing a roof inspection, but I'm looking at the siding. And this siding has fallen. And it looks like it fell maybe, and that's no big deal. And it was refastened, but it wasn't refastened well. It was like they didn't push the siding up against the, the rake board here. Left some gap. So we don't want gaps. Never want an open gap, right? So remember where the roof met the siding? Well, now the siding is meeting some capping and there's an open gap. That's not good. There's other roof systems. Um, this is uh, probably a porch, right? I'm looking behind and this is a porch and all the roofing nails, the fasteners have been sealed with black tar, roof sealant. That's good, but ideally, I want to know why did they do that. Do we have a system with the? We have a problem with the fasteners. Maybe they're all rusted. They're not miss. They're missing washers. They're not installed properly. Or is this just a maintenance thing that my client needs to do every year? What did was this just done this year? Here's another piece of siding, where this metal roof of the porch meets the hard stucco of the house. There has to be some kind of sealant or flashing here to divert water away. Remember, roof water can, let's say there's no gutter here. Roof is roof water is going to drain away, or maybe there's a wind-driven rain hitting the siding, and it comes down here where this roof material, roof covering material meets the siding. It's a critical area for a home inspector to check. And someone just laid a piece of siding, aluminum siding down, and put a nail down. I don't know what that means. Lift it up, take a look. Oh, there's an actual gap. So they were allowing water to simply drain through down the exterior siding and have an open gap in between. There was originally an open gap between the porch roof and the house. That's okay. But maybe someone said like, oh, we're still getting wet, you know? So let's cap this off. Well, this looks like a two by four not treated, not pressure treated. So it's starting to rot and it's not really done very well. You can see, right? They just put a piece of metal. So that's going to be loose. It's not going to be watertight. Wasn't done by a roofer. Wasn't done by a roofing company. It's probably going to leak, maybe fall apart. So I want my client to understand that story that if there are a few things on the roof that need to, be, here's a roofing nail that's backed out of probably the wood ridge uh, wood rafter that it was installed in. I haven't seen below, but I'm assuming it's going to be wood. And it's backed out and it's lifted up. It's a roofing nail. I don't see a, a gasket. It's not fastened well. It's not a screw. So it's backed up. And that's why they're hitting all of these fasteners with roofing tar. And it looks new, doesn't it? The roofing sealant looks new, like they knew a home inspection was coming and they just, uh, let's let's cover up all these things. So underneath, right? I inspect from above and below. I want to see, has anything been leaking? And this was painted, painted white. So, you know, I don't know. All I can report upon are defects that I both observe and consider to be major material defects. And this was just painted. All this stuff was painted white. So we could ask the seller maybe to disclose prior performance of the roof. And this is that 
gap, that open gap. Very strange kind of things. And I can see, you know, they didn't paint this, the house siding. So there's watermarks. Stucco is really great. When you're looking for watermarks on stucco, it tends to hold it very well. It stains, doesn't really shed dirty water, kind of absorbs it into the stucco. So this is an indication of a prior roof leak from that area. And it's been painted. And I really can't see anything. But it's pretty good information still, right? I don't know what's going on above this, but my client has a pretty good idea of what needs to be done on that porch roof and on the house roof as well. And this is um, a poor installation of a, there's an electrical wire hanging loosely at this spotlight here. I understand a homeowner, you know, there's a homeowner that did this, was an electrician. It's difficult to get that wire installed properly through the attic system and down through a wall and all that stuff. This is a very quick way and poor way of doing it. And it's not safe. All right. Other systems. While I'm on the roof, this is just the roof. Looking at the chimney. If there's a chimney, I, I'm required to inspect it according to the standards of practice. I'm going to take a look at the chimney. I'm not required to look at the interior flue. This is just the exterior part. And right now, what do you see? Yeah, I got some cracks, right? And the shape of this chimney, I know it's not big enough. The dimension isn't wide enough. The interior flue liner isn't the size big enough for a fireplace. It's for a heating system. It's a fuel burning heating system that I have. And this is the masonry chimney stack. It's masonry because it's made out of brick and concrete block. And what do you see? This is the interior flue and I see cracks. You never want to see cracks, really, on the interior flue liner or on this crown that diverts water from the top of the chimney stack. So now water can get into the chimney through a cracked flue liner, which can't be cracked at all. And then it can get into the, the top of the chimney stack as well. You're not required to inspect the interior flue, but... I took the cap off, the screen off. I did a camera shot. It's a good thing I did. This is not a CSI, a, a certified chimney sweep level one inspector. No, this is a home inspector using visual only techniques to look for problems that I consider to be major defects. And this is major defects. This is a, a damaged flue liner that I'm seeing with pieces missing and a crack, and water damage, and pieces, okay? There are holes in the interior flue liner. I'm not sure if the entire flue liner needs to be replaced, a new stainless steel pipe liner installed. That's not my call. I am required to report upon defects that I, I both observe and deem to be material. And I know we have cracks in the flue liner. This is my way of telling my client the story of the flu liner, which is really important. It's an important system. Can't be damaged. Can't have holes in it. And we're going to give it to someone else to further evaluate. A chimney sweep. They're going to throw a camera down the flu. Something that I don't do. Or I could do if I was certified and I had a sewer scope training class, which InterNACHI has. Okay, so this is the chimney stack and the flashing around here isn't very good either. You shouldn't really see this edge of the, the counter flashing, right? There's supposed to be step flashing and this is counter flashing. And I don't know why this is hanging over the shingles. It doesn't look very good. Oh, maybe it is step flashing. So it's not really, and oh, this is old. So there's old, new, there's stucco, there's cracks, there's loose flashing. It was torn out. It was installed back in. That's a roof fastener there that's not sealed. And it goes through the top of the flashing, through the shingles. So this is, again, a flashing issue, just like the other flashing issues that are not reliable. Second chimney stack. This one, I can tell, is a fireplace because of its shape. I have experience inspecting these chimneys. This is a masonry chimney stack. I can see the flashing, same problem, right? And I've, oh, I've got a, a screen and a, a cap, a hood, a rain, rain hood. But I've got a, there's something here. So the, the structure looks okay. Oh, 
Got some cracks on the crown and some worn out areas. This is really bad. So do you know what this is? This black, shiny stuff on top of a fireplace chimney stack? Right. Creosote. It's not brown and flaky and powdery. It's shiny. It's creosote, and it's kind of like fuel, and it can catch on fire. It's shiny. It's like tar. It's a fuel, and it can catch on fire. And this is at the top of the chimney stack. And it, it's actually so thick. I don't know what they've been burning. Uh, tires or something. I don't know. But it's flammable. So there's a fire hazard. When I get to this point, like I'm feeling really good as a home inspector. Remember, in business, you want to overwhelm your clients with valuable information so that the cost of retrieving that information is worth it. So in, in business and in marketing, you want to overwhelm your clients with incredible value. And compared to the cost, it should be worth it to your client. So if the, the value of the information is overwhelming compared to the cost, it's a good decision for your client to hire you. So I'm giving my client really good information. I'm going to overwhelm them with really good information. I'm not going to scare them, but they need to know about these problems and get them fixed. I'm not going to kill this deal. There's hardly anything, there's nothing a home inspector can say that can kill a deal. It's really up to the real estate agent or the home buyer, my clients, the home buyer, to find the right house. You have to pair those two up. You have to find the right house, the right location, the right school area, and the right buyer for the right price. All those things have to come together. If I have a client, who has fallen in love with this house because it's taken them months to get here. And they found this dream home and they found the lender and the appraiser and the real estate agent and the school and the house and they, the, the, you know, they made an offer. They got, they got pre-approval and then the offer was accepted. Now we're at the inspection. There's nothing I can say. They found their dream home. What I'm doing is I'm telling them the story. And the story is, this is a good home so far. Yeah. It's got like three things I would fix. The flashing stuff, the the back porch roof, and and this chimney stuff, the flue liner of the chimneys, and this creosote. This is just a, a simple cleaning, but I just wouldn't use the fireplace until it's cleaned and inspected further by a chimney sweep. Flashing again. I think we've talked about this flashing, but this is kind of neat. The step flashing is installed, right? This is great. Step flashing was installed with every row of shingles, but the top of the step flashing is open right? There's no counter flashing. Or they could have grooved the masonry and bent in the top of the flashing. But still, counter flashing would be great, right? So here's what can happen. Remember that illustration of water traveling and hitting? Yeah. So I'm imagining water coming down the chimney stack, going in between the flashing here and the structure itself and getting underneath the roof covering shingles. Oh, that's exactly where you don't want water to go. While I'm coming down the ladder, I'm looking where the chimney meets the window capping here. There's a lot of aluminum capping. Maybe some older windows were removed. A smaller vinyl aluminum window was installed, and the capping was installed on top of that. When that happens, there's a lot of places for water to get in and cause problems. There's the chimney clean out on the outside. There's the fireplace chimney there, gable vent. There's my ladder. I know what you're saying. It's not extended enough. I know. Don't use a ladder. You're not required to do this. Home inspectors are permitted to exceed the standards of practice, but you're not required. We have a ladder safety course as well. So this is the other shingle roof. I like to move my ladder around and get on the other roofs. And there's a, a shingle roof here. And this wire is a concern. It's about two feet off the roof there. 
That's not good. That's the main electrical line. So we have a tree branch in contact with the roof. A couple feet above is the main overhead service conductors from the telephone pole. And it almost touches, there it is from there, right? It almost touches the roof. It's one inch away. This is a fire hazard. Imagine this, uh, this is a rough edge. You know, this is granular. So this is essentially crushed stone on this roof covering material, asphalt roof covering material. And during a rainstorm, snowstorm, or a windstorm, this wire brushes up against the, the roof and it starts to spark and cause a house fire. And that's no good. So we need someone else here now, right? You can almost see it's almost touching here. So, so there is, um, there's a thing called code, building code. And home inspectors are not code inspectors. We do not inspect for code. But the things that you look for, well, it's kind of based upon code. Code is written so that homes and buildings are built to be safe and functional and healthy. It's not really a repair checklist. It's not a step-by-step, -step, this is how you fix stuff. So that when homes and buildings are built, they're built with safety in mind. And code changes and improves the quality of life for occupants of homes and buildings and the safety. So there's a code requirement that you know prevents this from happening. You don't have, there's a clearance. There's a minimum clearance. You can't have a, a main electrical wire within a couple inches of the roof, right? And there's certain things that a home inspector could put in the report that kind of describes the height of this clearance. How, what is a safe height? Or maybe a home inspector could say it's too close and we need an electrician to further evaluate or a code inspector to come in. This is too close. This is a fire hazard. Plus you can get electrocuted too. Um, so if you know a little bit of code, you'll probably become a, a better inspector. And InterNACHI has a lot of resources about that. Inspecting, you know, all of InterNACHI's, InterNACHI school, Home Inspector College, all the courses are based upon code. We essentially are training home inspectors to recognize things that violate code. Um, there's the other little shingle roof. I'm just concerned about that little bump there. That's okay. And some gutters need to be cleaned out. And then the gutters drain the gutter water down the downspouts and they dump around the building. And this is a hard surface driveway. And we want this hard surface sloped away. We want to divert water away from the house. We want the gutters to collect the water off the roof, downspouts bring it down, and then discharge away from the house. We want to always look for hard surfaces. They should be sloped away from the house. Remember that illustration of that house? You want things going away from the house. Here's a, this isn't a downspout. This is a discharge from a sump pump and it has to discharge away from the house. So there it is there. So I know I have probably a basement, a crawl space with a sump pump. There's a downspout, downspout chute. All this is good, getting it away. I would actually replace this with something plastic because concrete absorbs water and moisture moves in mysterious ways. It wicks, it is absorbed into masonry. Masonry loves to absorb moisture, brick, stone, concrete. It absorbs moisture and that moisture can travel in any direction it wants. So it absorbs, it goes from wet to dry. So if this is a dry area, and this is a wet area, which it is. And then in between is a medium that allows wicking or moisture to move and travel. Um, maybe something else should be put here. Maybe a plastic chute. Or if this is my house, I dig a hole, chip out the concrete, put in a drainage pipe, and take this water out away. It'd go underground. 
you can have this conversation as a home inspector with your clients. It really doesn't matter. What really matters is your inspection report should include observed defects that you consider to be material. There are two different shingles on the roof. I believe the shingles that are on the roof with I the skylights is different from the house roof. Low but they're quality. in both good shape. Be, you're not shooting I don't see anything cracked or damaged or missing. You're just providing information to your client that they wouldn't otherwise be able to see. So I don't bring my clients up. There's the a ridge vent providing right. ventilation for the attic space. But my video the vent can help explain vent. things that That's I good. see. They the flashing around the sewer the vent pipe has been this heavily sealed. Like that needs to be monitored. As well. The flashing around the chimney stack has been heavily sealed and repaired. It may have leaked in the past. So my client can the hear or read around the my text left side my skylight pictures, has been sealed. That may have leaked in the past as well. Worth a words. At the heating system awesome. chimney stack, right. the liner, so the terracotta liner, has been cracked and damaged at the top. Up on the and inside, you can see some damage inside. So this should be inspected by chimney sweep. They were there with us at the fireplace chimney. There's really a get to see black shiny like creosote. Shiny creosote. This is a fire hazard. But I really love video. The screen is almost clogged with creosote. The ability, all the software providers This needs to be swept and cleaned by a chimney professional. And report. also the flashing your where the roof meets the stack. Is essentially in the cloud. So now you can have your inspection report made out of words, pictures, um, video, and internet illustrations. Next system is exterior. But let me take a look. That's two systems, two systems down, roof and exterior. Roof is about 15 minutes, exterior is about 15 minutes. And I've already written the inspection report for those two systems because I take my phone with me and I'm writing the inspection report as I inspect. So roof and exterior. We're doing the exterior next. Let me take a look. Um, Jason says, the marketing aspects you are referring to, Inspector Media or something else, I know that InterNACHI has marketing through Inspector Outlet. So for marketing, go to nachi.org slash marketing, nachi.org slash marketing. Start there. Um, let's see, by structure, you're referring to the overall structure of the home, like the foundation. Yes. How many pictures do you take in a typical inspection? Um, about 300. Do you include them all in the report? Ryan asks, no, I don't include them all in the inspection report, only about 40 of them, but I give my clients all of the inspection pictures and video. Uh, it's Richard says, it seems like part of the inspection is done by room or part is done by system. If you are doing plumbing and electrical before kitchen and laundry, will you be those plate multiple places? Yeah, I will overlap a lot of things except for the roof. If I have to go up on a roof I, a second time, I will, but rarely. So a lot of the systems overlap. And while I'm inspecting the exterior, I may come across uh, the air conditioner compressor unit, and it's easy for me to flip back and forth in between systems using my inspection software. Do I include uh, infrared in your standard home inspection? I do. Um, it simply makes me a better home inspector. So here's a couple of cheap ones. I don't know if they still make them, but I've got my FLIR. I love FLIR. Um, here's my FLIR. Well, it used to be C2. I think this is a C, a C something, C5. And this is a E5. The E5 is like a, oh, here, I'll hold it like that. E5 and C5. And they're they're really awesome. Um, I use them like a flashlight. I think of infrared cameras like a flashlight. I wouldn't do an inspection without a flashlight. Using a flashlight is exceeding the standards of practice because the word flashlight doesn't appear in the standards of practice. So you're using a tool. It's not a specialized tool. Infrared camera is not really a specialized tool. It's like a flashlight that allows you to see things that you wouldn't normally be able to see without it. So a flashlight helps me see things I wouldn't normally be able to see without it, right? I can take a look around, see things, right? And I'm looking around, you know, it's dark, and now it's like, and it's red. I can see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. And I don't charge extra separately for my infrared. What I do is I increase my price. I, I, figure out how I can increase my gross revenue by providing 
additional value. If I can overwhelm my client with valuable information provided by a simple device like an infrared camera, then that means my fee can go up. I'm always trying to increase my fee. How do I do that? By increasing value. I don't charge based upon the amount of time it takes me to do an inspection. I charge based upon the value of the information provided. A lot of commercial property inspectors have clients who need valuable information and they can't get that information. They can't gather that information without a commercial property inspector. So they'll spend thousands of dollars getting valuable information before they spend millions of dollars on a commercial building. That's overwhelming your clients with incredible value compared to the cost of gathering that information and that valuable information. That's the calculation. You want to overwhelm your clients with incredible value and compare it to the cost. And if it's, if that information and that value bull information is overwhelming compared to the cost, then yeah, it's a good decision. Your clients will hire you instead of the next inspector. So in your marketing, you always have to figure out what makes me more valuable than anyone else in the market area. Why am I in demand? Why should I be hired instead of someone else? So that's why I use infrared. Makes me a better home inspector, provides incredible value, valuable information, unique information. I can see things that other inspectors can't see and I don't charge for it separately. I include the valuable service, the tool, and I increase my inspection fee. It's like providing a home maintenance book. That's overwhelming my clients with additional valuable information. During the inspection, I give my client the home maintenance book. This is how I'm going to show you how your home works and how to maintain it. But here's a home maintenance book. It's InterNACHI's home maintenance book. InterNACHI's home maintenance book is only $2.70. So what you should do is give every client a home maintenance book. That overwhelms your client with valuable information compared to the cost. What is the cost? It's included with the inspection. Well, kind of, right? So if your inspection was $250, how much are you actually going to charge? You're going to charge $255 to, so that each client of yours buys their own home inspection book. You don't want to increase your costs, your operating costs or your overhead costs. You don't want to buy this without thinking of raising your fees. You want every client to pay you to use your infrared camera so that this is free. This is not an overhead cost. You increase the value of the information you're gathering by providing you know, these services and you allow your clients to pay for that. You know, so that's why the value has to be overwhelming compared to the cost. And if it's a little iffy, if the value of your service compared to the cost, it's kind of uh, sketchy, you're not too sure, then you have a problem with your business. You have a problem maybe with your marketing. Maybe you're not marketing how wonderful, how fantastic, how valuable you are. Maybe you're a great home inspector providing really great information, but you're not marketing it well. That's why you need a marketing team. Don't do it on your own. Delegate it down to a professional team of marketers. And that's InterNACHI's marketing team. Don't design your own logo. That's InterNACHI's marketing team. Don't design your own website. Oh my goodness. That's InterNACHI's official vendor for website designs. Exterior, standards of practice, thinking about water and hard surfaces. Water needs to get away. It's a short step. Might be a little surprising. Um, it's shorter than this step, right? It's maybe seven and a half inches is like four. Brand new asphalt driveway, that's great. Water needs to be diverted away. While I'm inspecting the exterior, I'm checking out all kinds of things. This is a, an exterior hose bib. I'm not sure why they call it hose bib. There's a water faucet on the outside of the house. It needs to be frost proof. 
um, ideally, especially for this client uh, uh, that's buying a home in Pennsylvania. So it's a cold climate. I'm looking at the steps, making sure they're they're all, you know, uniform. That there's a handrail for the steps, and there's um the front step. And there's a handrail here. While I'm checking out the handrail, there's also these pipes. You may not recognize this, but this is a an oil fill and vent. Oil fill pipe and vent pipe. And I know I have a, a tank somewhere. Because it's close to the house, it's not probably in the ground. Buried oil tank in the ground is not good. It's probably in the basement. So the, here's the oil fill and vent pipe. There's an oil fill and vent pipe. So oil fill pipe, you push oil in to a tank, you vent out air, displaces air. That's all that is. Got some other components, like this little nook here with the windows and the roof. This is a uh, poor installation. Um, all exterior receptacles need to be GFCI protected. So I'll go around with my GFCI tester. The siding, you know, it's pretty good. Steel siding, got the flashing areas on the roof, right? There's the air conditioner unit. It's on a nice base. Shut off. Fins are okay. Take a look at the manufacturing label. There's an air conditioner through wall unit just above it. So I think this was original to the house. They didn't have central air and they probably installed something. And I'm assuming it's going to be in the basement or in the crawl space, the air handler. Not sure yet. There's the stucco, hard coat stucco. This is a masonry house. It's built out of concrete units. Not sure what that is. Oh, that's the cellar. That's a pipe coming from a drain from somewhere. I, I don't know. It's just there. Strange thing. I don't have to know everything. If I don't know what this is, guess what I say? I don't know. So great. I don't have to know everything. So I don't know what that is. It looks like a discharge for a sump pump, but that was on the other side. Another frost-free hose bib. That's good. Here's steps to the other door of the house. And the first two steps, missing a handrail. Remember code? Code says a handrail is required when there is a stairway with four or more risers. However, I'm not a code inspector. I'm a home inspector. Uh, so if my client is an 80-year-old person who just needs assistance and help getting up the steps, she can get up the steps, but just needs a little help. This is going to be impossible for her. She's going to have to let go right here, coming down the stairs. And she's got two more, three, two, three more risers to go. My client can't handle this. They can't get into their own house without a handrail here. I'm going to recognize that because I'm my report is going to benefit my client. So I'm going to put this in the report as a handrail recommended for my client. But is it actually going to do anything? I don't know. That's not my problem. I'm not uh, the code inspector. I don't have the authority to make people do that. I'm just a home inspector. The seller, the occupant, the owner does not have to take my recommendations and fix stuff. Remember, I'm providing information to my client who's going to be overwhelmed by the valuable information in relation to the cost of getting that information. And this is information that my client probably wants. They want to know the story of how am I going to get up into my house without a handrail? They may have to reconsider some things. They'll probably buy the house and extend this handrail later with a contractor. I'm looking for wood rot here at the bottom tread of this slider door. It looks a little funky and some paint here. So I'm going to do a little tap test or prick test with my screwdriver. Just tap, tap, tap. You know, if I see any wood rot, this is peeling paint here. Not bad, but it can get, you know, rotten if it's not maintained. So a little rot there, no big deal. Patio area underneath that steel roof. Remember that? 
The load bearing components look good. The patio looks good. There's the main electrical line. Remember the electrical line over the roof? Yeah, we're here where it comes down into the meter and then it goes into the main electrical line, main electrical panel in the basement right there. Got propane, got two propane tanks. One's not used, one's a little guy and uh, got a plant on top of it. I'm not sure what that's for yet. Um, just taking a look at the, red, the, the rest of the exterior. So this is the masonry stucco hard coat on top of concrete masonry units and maybe there was a window air conditioner here right and a drained condensate down here not sure not sure but again stucco is kind of funny because it gets dirty real quick when there's dirty water on it um this plastic hood probably for a dryer needs to be replaced there's been some patching some staining some patching I don't see any structural problems. Looking for big cracks, big open cracks, displacement, movement, things like that. There's a detached garage. You're required to inspect garages. So I'm gonna take a look at that. The roof looks good. The exterior looks good. This is the interior. Got some garage door openers, new garage door openers. Unfortunately, they're um, installed with extension cords. Extension cords are really for temporary use only. So. Um, you really need a, a nice new plug. There's no GFCI protection in the garage. There's an electrical line and then it distributes. So there's probably just one breaker and an underground wire to the, supply the, the lighting and the GFCI protected receptacle in the garage and the garage door openers. Um, this is not a sub panel kind of thing going on, but I'll take a look at the structure. It looks really good. I don't see any problems on the interior or the exterior. There's a lot of stuff that's in my way, so I can't really see everything, but I'm taking a look at as best I can and little safety devices on the garage door openers. Heating system, thermostat, old thermostat, old system, boiler. Ah, remember the fill and vent pipe? I have an oil tank, oil boiler. So what an oil boiler is, is a box, cast iron usually, bolted together. There's a a unit, uh, a space inside for water to flow through, and there's fire underneath, flamed by, fueled by flaming oil. You ignite the oil, heats up the chamber, a pump circulates that water through the, the cast iron, hot cast iron, and is distributed. So instead of like a furnace where there's air moving through a heat exchanger, there's water moving through a heat exchanger, and it's made out of um, hot cast iron components. There's a shut-off switch to the boiler. There's the circulating pump that circulates water. There's the burner that draws air, uh, sorry, draws water, oil <laughs> through a filter, um, mystifies it, ignites it, spits out a flame um, into a chamber. There's the oil filter there, and there's the oil tank. Fill and vent pipe. Um, and there's the tank itself so on legs. There's the oil fill and vent pipe there, the fill and the vent. And there's the gauge, it's about half full. And there's the shutoff valve there. And there's the, oh, someone lost their football. But there's the belly of the tank. I like to get my screwdriver and pound on it a little bit. I like to pound on the bottom of the, the pipes that are used for legs. And uh, looks in pretty good shape. There's the controls for the boiler, setting the temperature and the pressure. <clears throat> there's the burner chamber. You open that up and take a look at the flames while it's on. And there's the oil line through a shutoff valve there. And there's the exhaust pipe connector to the chimney stack that we saw, which has a cracked flue liner. Remember that? Expansion tank. When water heats up, it expands and needs to go somewhere or the pipes are going to knock. And there's um, some pressure regulators and temperature pressure relief valves. I think we saw that in a previous picture. There's a TPR valve there, discharged to the floor. Everything looks good. Turn it on, circulate water. Don't necessarily have to heat up the whole house, but um, we want to see it circulate and go through a cycle. There's a cooling system. Remember the air conditioner on the outside? air handler on the inside 
and there's the air filter, one main return register for the whole house. That's okay. You know, it was added on after the house was built, obviously. It's an older house. It's a newer unit with the big ducts, right? Air return coming in. It's supported well. There's a unit there. Catch pan, water catch pan, air conditioner and air handler will produce condensate. And if there's a leak, we want to catch it, especially if it's in the attic. Shut off. There's a unit there itself with a circulating fan. There's a condensate. The coil will produce condensate. It drains out of out of the unit and into a, a trap and then into the, the pan itself or outside. So there's nothing going on. You know, the the water, the condensate should drain away. It's probably going into a gutter that I did not see. That's okay. And um, the pan is for catching water leaks. If the pan is filled with water, which it looked like it was a little bit, a little, little puddle, then there, that's a problem. That's an issue. I'll turn the air conditioner on um, to see if it's and it's installed and hung from the rafters. That's good. I'll take a look at the ductwork. We don't want open areas like this. We want it nice and sealed and insulated and then... Um, we don't want any condensation problems or air leakage issues. There's a supply probably to a ceiling somewhere. There's a cold air return. There's the drain. So I get to see it on the other side. So it should drain away from the unit. If it clogs up, it goes back into the pan. And also, if the pan, if the unit leaks, the pan's going to drain into this system. Sometimes they have two separate pipes separating those two functions. Looks pretty good. I like it. Water heating equipment. And water heating equipment or a water heater, um, I wouldn't say a hot water tank. Um, it's really a water heating appliance or water heating equipment or a water heater. Code has those words. Um, so a water heater is any appliance that heats potable water and supplies it to the Potable water distribution system of a house or building. And there's a 2021 IRC code, chapter 28 goes over water heating equipment. So you inspect the water heating equipment of a boiler by looking at the coil. There's a domestic coil, we call it. It's cold water going in through a coil, submersed in this very hot, almost boiling water, and it comes out hot, super hot. It comes out really hot, like 180, 200 degrees. So there should be a tempering valve, uh, a valve between the hot out and cold in that allows cold water to temper the, the hot water being distributed. We don't want scalding hot water. Anything over 110 degrees um, as could hurt you. So uh, you want to be able to control the, the temperature of the water coming out of that hot boiler. Plumbing system is another system in the standards of practice. I think of water coming in and then water going out, or water coming in and sewer going out, in, out. So what's my in? Public water. Here's the main water valve, underground, through the basement floor, uh, basement foundation wall, through a shutoff valve, water meter, distributed. Um, there's the valve there, the water meter. I like to rub my hand underneath the valves and water meter if it's wet then I know I have a leak. There's a jumper cable. It's part of electrical bonding. The next system is basement foundation crawl space and structure. Um, in this basement, there's some hams drying out. <laughs> it smelled good, but I uh, just wanted to put that in the report. That's uh, how my grandmother used to do it, right? Um, old school. And some, I think, homemade wine jugs. I take pictures of it. I, I, I'm not putting this in the report unless someone says, what smells down here? I'm not putting this in the report. I don't care if someone makes their own wine or hangs their meat or whatever. I think it's fantastic. But it's not really part of my report. But I'm going to take a picture of it just in case it comes back. Like, hey, did you happen to see? And I say, yeah. And there's uh, an open window here. That's okay. But maybe there's an indoor air quality issue or um, something. I just want to make sure that I have documented the current condition of the home as I saw it on the day of the inspection. 
So this kind of helps me out, all this stuff around here. Love home brewing. It's a great, great hobby. I just want to take a picture of it. It's not going to be in the report. I'm not going to share it. I'm not going to criticize it or anything like that. Not at all. But if something happens in the past, like uh, something happens after the inspection, I'll have these pictures. You know, what was, why is there so many bugs? Maybe it flies down in the basement or was that smell or was that stain on the wall or why is this area, you know, so I'll take pictures of things. Okay. And one of the things I like to take a picture of is moisture, uh, things related to moisture intrusion. This is a great thing here. This is a, I think they chopped this concrete up and put in a sump pump pit. This is a bucket ready to go with a pump, right? It's ready to go. It has the dr perimeter drainage, has the channel, open channel into a, a pit. There's no standing water. That's good. So it's ready to go with a pump. They have one in the other side. And I think this is original to the house because the the hole is smaller and it's kind of like hand dug and it's kind of dirty and uh, it's not, um, it doesn't have a plastic uh, perimeter bucket and the channels are different. And they painted up to this point. So you don't have to, as a home inspector, you know, when we see new paint, you know, with water stains on top of the new paint, it's probably an indication that the basement has water intrusion problems, no big deal. The other sump pump, it's not the water problem over there. It's the water problems over here, and that's why I have the sump pump. And remember the discharge? We have a discharge outside. Today, it's dry, powder dry, dusty dry. But maybe during a rainstorm that comes in the future, which is not my responsibility. I can't predict whether this thing fills up with water or not. But today, it's not filled with water and it discharges outside. That's pretty good. I think it was a homemade installation. There's really no check valve or anything like that or a cover. Um, and it may not be installed properly. There's a little brick there to prevent it from shaking or maybe falling over. I'm not sure. Maybe not totally reliable, but pretty good. I'll test it by lifting up the float and just seeing if the motor kicks on. I'm not going to discharge water by filling up the, the water with a hose or anything like that. I like to take pictures of the basement like this so that um, people know that I can't see through walls, can't see through paneling. I don't know what's behind here. I'm assuming it's the foundation wall, but I don't know what's what's going on, what's taking place. I can only report upon the things that I both observe and deem to be considered to be a material defect. And then this is the steel beam and the I'm looking for wood destroying organisms as well, or wood rot or water, all kinds of stuff. I like to see the the dimensions of the floor joists. Um, how the floor floor structure, the decking is installed. This is all original. I can tell it's very old. Looks in really good shape. And this is a split level. So there's kind of like different levels. So I was telling my client, this is like the first level is like the living room and the kitchen. So I've got a kitchen down here, it's kind of an odd kitchen. It's like an apartment because the stove is tucked in the corner here. And I don't like it that's so close to the wall. It's a fire hazard. And then there's a refrigerator. I mean, they should switch those two. I think that would help out a little bit. But anyways, this is the first floor and it has a fireplace and a finished area. And I'm looking for water penetration, you know, around here because this is a split level. This is down below grade and I'm looking around. And one of the things I like to use is uh, this instrument. You can get it from Inspector Outlet inspectoroutlet.com and it's got some pins here and it just helps me do a better inspection, right? I'm adding value too to my inspection report. My client gets incredible information. And what's the information? Well, it's a, if I, so it's a moisture meter. Gives me an audible signal and a visual signal. And I use these probes to probe things above my head that I can't reach easily. And I probe things through the carpeting, right? So I'll do, so you see me? Yeah, dry, dry, dry. And I probe through the carpeting and the pad. And I can also touch things like a wall, make sure it's dry. I'm not quantitative. This isn't quantitative. I don't care about uh, moisture content. 
the moisture content, you know, is it about 20% or not in a piece of wood or anything? Blah, blah, blah. I'm just seeing if it's like, is it wet? You know, it, it collapses. Also, it's a gardening tool. You know, you garden with it. It's three tine, three tines. One, I kind of straighten out with a hammer and it's extendable. And I can reach up. If I'm in the basement, reaching above the foundation wall for the insulation, that's what I would do. And I can move insulation and then put it right back. Also have a moisture meter. When you talk about infrared, this is the companion to an infrared camera, a moisture meter. This is my moisture meter here. It has pins as well as um, non-invasive probing. So these tools allow me to check out a basement like this very easily, very quickly. Uh, somebody cut something. Maybe this was a leak, a leak in the past and they patched it up. So I want to take a picture of it and put it in the report. What I would say here is that there's an indication of some repair of a ceiling, possibly a prior water leak from a, an appliance upstairs or a fixture upstairs. Um, ask the seller for more information about this patch repair job in the ceiling of the room, right? Laundry. In this house, the laundry was um, kind of like downstairs and there's a, a kitchen sink counter thing, but with a clothes washer there. And there's the water supply to the clothes washer and the hoses and the discharge goes into the kitchen sink next to the washer. It's kind of like an appliance, kind of like um, mishmash of appliances and they kind of put them together in this kind of like lower level apartment area. And the dryer uh, plug was there, but they didn't use it. They have it hardwired. So this is from the electrical panel. You can't disconnect the dryer. Um, so it needs a plug and there's the discharge on the outside. Remember the hood was cracked, the termination hood, electrical. So before we get to the electrical, anybody have any? Seems like way I would have talked about. It was, um, where is the code resource located with InterNACHI? So John, go to nachiorg slash education, um, NACHI's education page. If you go to any NACHI.org page and you go to get started, you scroll down to training and education, you could type in um, code. So there's energy code of ethics, there's Ohio code, advanced residential code inspection, practice questions, property maintenance and housing code inspection course. So there's some, there's some resources there. Um, I love Spectora, Ben, but your layout looked different next generation. I don't know. I, don't know. I gave uh, Spectora, Spectora asked me to um, write up a template. So I did real quick and shared my template. Um, with them. Do clients suspect you in my reports from the past are different? They look different when you switch software, you know, kind of changes things. But um, all software companies provide software that uh, allow you to customize your reports. The look of your report can be customized. Inspectora does a great job with that. Uh, sorry, let's stay line. How soon, Mario, how soon can you and inspector after you pass your state license and inspector and when's a good time to start your website for your business? Um, well, uh, it all depends on the state. So you mentioned the state license. So if the state is licensing inspectors, they have a step-by-step -step process. And if one of the steps is you have to have a certain amount of education, internet, you can provide that for you to help you fulfill the state requirements. If there's an exam, we have exam prep tools for you. Um, so it's really after, I guess you um, complete all the state requirements, you can become a home inspector, right? Um, when is a good time to start your website for your business? And now it's a good time to just think about it. Um, what you wanna think about is, um, I think the process really is first, you go and get your license if there's a, a requirement for a license. And then you get InterNACHI certified because InterNACHI has all these other resources that you want to take advantage of, the business and the marketing resources. 
And you have to be a member of InterNACHI and then be a certified inspector. And then you go to the InterNACHI marketing team and allow them to work with you. There are half a dozen professionals, consultants, advisors, illustrators, designers, and you don't pay for their work. All of their design work is free. And then you get your website designed because you're going to take the materials that were designed by InterNACHI's marketing team and put it on your website. Um, and to get a website, you go to nachi.org slash website. InterNACHI has an official vendor for Inspector Website Designs. And that's Inspector Website Builder. Um, but yeah, oil vent pipe is way too low. I know. Raymond, yep, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, it should be relatively the same. I would say, what is it? The, the vent, the vent should be higher than the fill, right? Um, Ben, recommend kinds of drones for roof inspections. What do you look out for while making a drone choose for roof inspection? Um, I like DJI minis, DJI minis, 4K cameras. Um, less than 250 grams. That's light and weight. So if you're traveling <laughs> by air or something, you can take it on a plane. Um, and they're affordable, like 500 bucks. And so you can perform a roof inspection from the safety of the ground. You can perform a roof inspection without ever leaving the ground. FAA, United States, has to you, you are required, even if you're having fun, you're required to take an, an exam, the FAA drone exam for both people who are having just fun, you have to take it now and you have to register your drone. And if you are doing it for commercial purposes, like an inspection, um, you have to take the other type of, you have to become a, a pilot, essentially. You have to take the pilot exam. InterNACHI -E has... Uh, a course to help you pass that exam. So you go to our nachi.org page, any nachi.org page, you go to get started, training and education, search for a drone course. So FAA drone pilot recurrent training part 107 small unmanned aircraft course. FAA has the same course on their site. I like this one because you can manage it through your InterNACHI account. You can jump right in. It remembers where you are and you can take it over and over again and you get a nice certificate and all that stuff. Um, is there a specific boiler or heating system that you don't turn on during it? No, I, I turn everything on. If it's using normal operating controls, I turn on every heating and cooling system and then I put it right back where it was. Um, wet wall and basement? Yep, probably wet wall. How much is that moisture meter? Uh, not much. You can go to inspector outlet, inspector outlet.com there's a get a free monster ticket let's see how do i search for moisture search for moisture and there it is uh less than 90 dollars. that's my favorite one x tech because it has the combination it has the pins and also the pinless um does internet help find clients heck yeah so after you get a website designed um, here's this, here's the page for websites, natchit.org slash website, and it's only $299. And actually tried to bring it down for free, but you have to pay the designers. They have to make money too, just like you make money doing home inspections. Um, so this is an, a, a company that we partnered with outside of InterNACHI and they are InterNACHI's exclusive vendor for website designs. And we brought it down to $299. And they design websites just for internet members. So get go to the marketing team, get a logo, get the, all the free consultation, all the free design, and then you put all that stuff on the website. They'll just grab all of your internet marketing team design stuff and put it on your website for $2.99. One fee. Do not pay monthly management fees for websites. You don't have to do that. It's BS. There's no reason to pay anybody to manage your website once it's designed. I thought we got over that. I keep bumping into inspectors who are paying like $500 a month 
for someone to manage their website, or if, even if it's $50 a month to manage their website, there's nothing to manage. So what our vendor does is they build you a website for $299 and put it in your account, Wix account, W-I-X.com. You can, you can build your own website right now, Wix.com. Go to Wix.com and start building your website. Make an account and build a website. It's, it's $16 a month. That's the hosting fee that Wix will charge you. $16 a month. And it comes with a domain. $16 a month. That's it. Go ahead and build your own website. Wix.com. Start your own website. You're going to pay about $16, maybe $20 a month. That's it. That's all you'd pay for. Now, if you want a website designed professionally by Internet Chief's official vendor, you want it designed right, you want to design that schedules clients. $299 one-time fee. And they put that designed website into your Wix account. It's up to you. Go to Wix.com, make an account, design your own website, or hire InterNACHI's partner to design a website for you. Do not spend a lot of money on websites. You can build them yourself, but I wouldn't. Remember, delegate. That's the key to success. Delegate down for 300 bucks, less than a home inspection. One time fee, hire an Etchy's inspector website builder. Have them build a website in your Wix account. You control everything. Don't, don't let anybody own your domain or your website. Don't let anybody tell you you don't have access to your website. You don't have the analytics or something. Inspector website builder provides SEO designed websites. They include, they include the SEO. It's no big deal. Don't pay for SEO. It comes with it. What you have to do is get Google reviews. So that means you need clients. That means you have to do inspections. If you're new, just do free inspections for your neighbors. Get 10, 20 neighbors, 20 inspections for free, 20 Google reviews. Put that on your website. You're doing well. Don't worry about SEO. All right. How did I get on this? Somebody asked a question about websites. Oh, uh, no, leads. Okay. So you get a website and then you go to Natchi.org. Let's see. How should I? I'm going to take you here first. Natchi.org slash everything. Go to Natchi.org slash everything. Step five is you get a domain, you get a logo, you get a website, and then you get free job leads. Natchi.org slash everything. Step five, you get a domain. Here's how you get a domain. Get a business logo. Here's a link on how to get a business logo, logo from InterNACHI's marketing team. You put that logo on your website. How do you get a website? You click that link. InterNACHI's official vendor for website designs. You update your InterNACHI member profile with your name, your company name, your phone number, your address, your email, that logo, and that new website. And then you list the zip codes or postal codes in that dashboard profile. Now, Internet she gets to work. We are out on the internet looking for people who are searching for a certified home inspector in their zip code, in their area, and we send them to you if you have updated your profile with your website. That's why you need a website. And then we teach you how to get a Google business profile and get Google reviews. It's very easy. But natchi.org slash everything, step five. That's the fun part. Uh, those hams are great. I know they look delicious too. Can you transfer a website to internet? Yes. Inspector website builder. Yes. IWB inspector website. Builder. Okay. Bum, 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 bum. Okay. Let's go back. Uh, let's try to go faster. Okay. We're going to go faster now. Hold on. This is the electrical panel. hundred amps. One finger means hundred amps. There's no more room. I think the 40 amps maybe for, I don't know. The, here's the here's the AC. What is this for? I don't know. Is it the electric stove, uh, air conditioner? I don't know. That's the air conditioner. So this is not labeled properly. We need labels so that if you need to turn something off, you know, you don't have to guess, right? What does seven mean? And then there's a 14 on a 20 amp breaker. It makes no sense. So it has to be specifically identified. All the breakers, according to code, shh, you're not, you're not supposed to comment on code. Every breaker should have a specific, um, unique 
identifying label. So I have a question for you. Uh, if you are attending the live webinar, you can see the question. If you're not, um, you're out of luck. It's a question about the dead front cover. And the question is, is a home inspector required to remove the dead front cover from the main electrical panel? Yes, no, or not sure. Are they required to remove the dead front cover? No. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. So put in your answer. All right. Most of you are answering correctly. In three, in two, in one. Participating? Any more? Any more answers? End the poll and share the results. Okay. You got it right. Most of you said no. You are not required as a home inspector to, to remove the dead front cover from the main electrical panel. So that those who said yes, you don't have to. You'll find that many people do, though, right? So I do. I remove the dead front cover. It's hazardous, it's dangerous, don't do it. I'm not recommending it, but you are permitted as a home inspector to exceed the standards of practice. There's that extra cable, it's 30 amp breaker, double tapped. I'm looking for, what I'm really looking for is um, aluminum wiring, solid branch circuit, aluminum wiring, and big fat breakers on small gauge wires. I'm also looking for paint spray, overheating, indications of overheating, or arcing, or sparking, or melting, or corrosion, or water, things like that. I just want everything looking good, just like it was installed yesterday. No one should be going in there and changing things. No homeowner should be adding things like this. They're adding an electrical line to a breaker, right? So we don't want any double taps, especially from the homeowner without a permit. Okay, so we have a fireplace section. Remember the fireplace? Well, it's really a fireplace or chimney. So this is the chimney of the heating system. Remember that is cracked interior flue and the interior flue is cracked and damaged. That's no good for the heating system and the flashing. And this is the fireplace. Remember this fireplace had creosote on the top. That's an awesome picture. That's gonna catch on fire. It's gonna be like a big torch coming out of the, fireplace chimney and then flashing is no good either and then there's the fireplace uh i can't see inside the fireplace they have an insert a cast iron insert and who knows what they're burning in there it's clean now i think they're burning more than just candles and there's damage this has been overheated maybe because of the fuel that they're burning maybe it's not just wood or something and then the structural masonry units inside the fireplace insert, which may or may not stay. I don't care. I'm inspecting what's installed right there. This is damaged. You don't want fire and heat to go through the firebox materials. And that's what's happening here. So that's a fire hazard. Got a couple of fire hazards there. Um, attic. Here's an attic access panel, upstairs, hallway, near the bathroom. Um, it's not insulated. It's not weather tight. This is a it's essentially a hole in the building envelope. This is outdoor air, right? It's ventilated. This is the attic space, cold air. I mean, you're conditioning the interior of the home air, and then it's just venting right out through. It's exhausting right out. And speaking of exhausts, every bathroom exhaust fan, mechanical vent, needs to terminate outside, needs to exhaust outside, not into the attic, outside outside the building envelope. If you exhaust moist, warm air into the attic space, like this one, in a cold climate, it can produce um, condensate, moisture problems, mold. It causes a lot of problems. It reduces the insulation value because it's damp and wet. Well, here we actually have missing insulation. So there's a few things here that can be improved. 
And as a homeowner, it's kind of fun to work on things like this. You can get all the, you can go to the Home Depot or Lowe's and get, you know, things and try to vent it outside. You may need some assistance with a roofer to get through the roof if you're going to vent through the roof or through a soft vent or something like that. But um, this is not good either. This is missing uh, a containment box. It's called an electrical box where you have wire connections inside that's containing that connection. It holds it and also protects it. And um, that's no good. So this was not installed by a professional, right? So that, no big deal. It's not a deal killer. It's just a something that needs to be attended to, okay? So you got some insulation in strange places, but there's some insulation there. This is the exterior wall. I don't know why they're insulating that. Um, this is the ceiling of the bedroom, probably downstairs or the second floor, the upper floor. So that's good. You don't have to seal the rafters. Uh, you know, I don't know what the, they're thinking here. This is the exterior wall. This is a gable vent. So I don't know what they're thinking. So there's that. I'm looking for water, penetration water coming through. Looks like possibly the, the plywood was replaced with the roof. Remember, there was a newer roof and an older roof. Maybe this was replaced. It looks good. Hardly any insulation. These are two by sixes. I'm standing on them. And um, you can see the thickness of the insulation is maybe three or four inches thick. Not thick at all. Should be about 12 inches thick in this climate area, climate zone. And there's a fan here. I didn't see it outside, actually. And I don't know what it's doing. Is it exhausting? Maybe this is the bathroom here. So I'll take a look. I'll try to remember what the heck this is. But I'm going to take a picture of it and ask the seller to explain it to my client what this is. There's duct work here, but they moved the insulation. So there's missing insulation. They just moved the insulation, installed the ductwork in the ceiling, and didn't put it back. Thanks. There's some duct work there, some duct work there. Again. There's the penetration into the ceiling through the plaster ceiling there, and they just moved the insulation around, but really didn't put it back together very well. So I'm taking pictures of a lot of things. Just so I can, one, share really valuable information that's in the picture, or two, just document things. Like I'm documenting a lot of things with a lot of those pictures. Bathrooms. Bathrooms aren't a section in the standards of practice. They are kind of but they're within the plumbing section. In my inspection report, I put bathrooms as a separate section. And here's the lowest floor half bath. There's the toilet, the sink, the sink there. Main bathroom, there's the toilet, run water, hot and cold water to the sink, hot and cold water to the tub and the drain and the, the valves and the, the drain pipe. And then the GFCI did not work because that needs to be replaced in the bath. And I pull the diverter valve and hit the shower, and then I flush the toilets again. And I want functional flow out of the shower while multiple systems are on, multiple fixtures are on. Hallway bathroom, flush the toilet, run the sink, look for plumbing leaks. It's the same thing. There's no GFCI receptacle in this bathroom. There's no receptacle at all in this bathroom. Sometimes on an older bathroom, being a light fixture, there's nothing there. When there's carpeting around the floor, that's not really sanitary. I'll take a look at what the carpeting is hiding or just covering. I don't want to say hiding. I'm not here to point fingers and accuse people of hiding things, but sometimes it's valuable to lift the carpeting and take a look underneath. So I'll do that. There's the main vent, cast iron vent pipe. Remember that cast iron vent pipe with the terrible flashing on the roof? Here's the stack here. Can't see anything really. That's it. That's all I get to see of the main stack sewer vent coming in. Remember the water line coming in, public water line through a meter? That was the stack going out. If I can't see it, I can't report upon it. The interior is basically a representative number of windows, doors, receptacles. You, have, you have turn on the light fixtures. Um, you can't do everything. So it's always a representative number. This is an older house, has two prong outlets, um, hot, neutral, no ground essentially. They could be replaced or updated. I would do that in a, a room that's used as an office or a kitchen, certainly. And if anything is updated, you need to AFCI and GFCI. Uh, I'd bring it up to code. The interior looks pretty good. 
you know, taking pictures of things. I don't see anything major, you know, kind of providing information that kind of uh, documents the condition of things and where the furniture was because, you know, there could be a hole behind this mirror. I have no idea, but I'm not going to move furniture during the inspection. That's not part of my, but if, if the, if the seller, you know, has a hole there and they put a mirror in front of it, well, we're going to see that during walkthrough, a closing walkthrough is a great opportunity for a home inspector to provide more information to their clients. So when I schedule a home inspection, I ask them to schedule a walkthrough, which will be when just before they close, like before they sign their line, sign their name on the, the line at the bank to buy the house for sure. They get one more chance to walk through the home and I will provide that service for an additional fee. And it's a great way to hire new inspectors and they'll do a walkthrough. It's an easy, um, no report um, unless something is wrong, then I'll write something up in a letter format on a letterhead. And um, it's a good service. And it provides uh, my client that extra uh, information. That, okay, you know, the seller moved out. Now we get to see things without furniture. And maybe we find things like a hole behind a mirror that was there. So now I'm scheduling a home inspection with ancillary services. And I'm scheduling a pre-closing walkthrough. And I'm telling my client, I'd like to schedule um, an annual home maintenance checkup. I'd like to come back in one year after you move in, make sure everything is okay. I'm not scheduling one inspection. I'm scheduling at least three. Home inspection, pre-closing walkthrough, annual checkup. And I got my original ancillary services with my home inspection and my ancillary services like radon and termite or pool or mold, right? So that's another way. There's only nine ways, really. I don't know if I can list all nine. There are nine ways to make more money in this business. And one of them is ancillary inspections. Ancillary inspections is a great opportunity for a home inspector to increase gross revenue without increasing your time. And that's one of those ways where we can increase that numerator of that fraction, increase gross revenue without increasing your time. Maybe an ancillary inspection, like a sewer scope inspection will take an extra 15, 30 minutes. That's not bad for an additional three or $400. Not bad at all. So it's money divided by time, gross revenue divided by the time. Interior fixtures, there's the skylights, they're always leaking. I see a water stain here that was painted. I'll put that in the report. I use a moisture probe and moisture meter. A um, little damage here, maybe from a pet or you know some furniture moving through the, the side, sliding door. Lower kitchen, remember that lower kitchen there? Got to it. There's the propane-fueled stove range, and oven. Not a good idea. So this is a fire hazard. Um, I've seen this many times where you put a big pot, right? You're boiling water or something, sauce. You have a big pot and the flames roll out from underneath the pot and hit the side wall. And this isn't like a fire rated wall, which it never is. Then it's going to catch on fire. It has a potential to catch on fire. I think it's already scorched that area. Uh, turn on the oven and the, the fan does not exhaust outside and the appliance is plugged in with an extension cord. That's not very good. And run water at the sink. Look for leaks underneath. This is a deteriorated P-trap. That's It's an S-trap. Actually, it's a vent problem. Um, and um, this is a soft brass chrome-plated trap. It's probably going to crush in my hand. That's okay. It's okay to do damage during an inspection. You're supposed to. Upper kitchen, um, the floor is okay. This is the main kitchen. Downstairs is like an apartment kitchen, ancillary, additional uh, kitchen. So checking out the, the water and the drainage, GFCI protection, dishwasher, I'll turn that on, and the basic vent that doesn't vent outside. Electric. We saw the breaker at the panel, electric range and oven. Now the inspection report. I'll get to the inspection report. And uh, there's the first section, roofing. 
Let's see, do we have any questions? Did you navigate through the attics that didn't have a walk? Yeah, but you don't have to. So if you wanted to disclaim it and not enter an attic space, which is a dangerous place, uh, I've fallen through uh, an attic floor um, because my foot slipped on a rafter, but it only happened once in 12 years. Look like the toilets didn't meet the distance requirements. Yeah, sometimes they don't on an older home. I'm not uh, jumping up and down about it. Um, I'll take a picture of it. If it's really a problem, like the door bangs into, the, the bathroom door bangs into the toilet or the cabinet is not really accessible because the shower is in the way or something like that, something obvious, I'll put it in the report. But um, this is an older home built a long time ago. And I get to choose because I'm a home inspector what codes and standards and building practices I can refer to. It's very difficult to change the bathrooms in an old home. It's basically tearing out everything and replumbing. So that's probably where, where I don't mention things. What I, what I do mention in relation to code during a home inspection are things like smoke detectors. Now, when this home was built 40, 50 years ago, there was probably something about a smoke detector. You need one in every house or something. Now it's every bedroom, the hallway, outside the bedrooms, every floor, you know, like GFCI protection. When this home was built, ground faults probably didn't exist. Let's say I'm inspecting a home that was built 100 years ago. Well, there is no GFCI protection, right, in, in the bathrooms or the kitchen, but it's easy to install. There are no smoke detectors, smoke alarms. 100 years ago, but it's required by code. And it's an easy thing to install. And it helps save your life. 100 years ago, you didn't need any handrails on any stairs. You just go for it. <laughs> Running start. But now, you know, we have code because unfortunately, usually firemen get hurt in a home or building. And they change the code based upon people getting hurt. That's why I really respect building code. They change the code also to make sure that buildings function better, that they're essentially healthy, as healthy as possible and safe and functioning. And that's what a home inspector is really into. I'm really into helping my clients with their home. How does it work? How to maintain it? Making sure everything is as safe as possible, functioning without major defects that I can see and healthy as possible. And if it's an old home that's missing ground faults because it was built way back then, I'm going to, as a home inspector, recommend installing GFCI receptacles according to modern code requirements because it's an easy thing and it helps save lives, just like smoke detectors, just like handrails. And if the insulation is missing, because back then we didn't insulate anything. A hundred years ago, we didn't insulate attic spaces. And I'm inspecting the home. I mean, I'm going to report upon the missing insulation. Ideally, if I'm doing my job well, in my opinion, I'm inspecting every home and building without regard to when that home was built, unless I'm doing like a permit inspection, making sure you know a permit was pulled and when did this addition, uh, you know, when did the addition take place? Someone installed a deck without a permit, but so when was it built? If I'm doing something specific like that, I'll pay attention to the date. But ideally, I'd be performing a home inspection without any regard to when the home was built. So that when I'm inspecting an interior guard and the space between the spindles of the interior guard is eight inches, large enough for a small child to fall through, I'm going to inspect that house without any regard to when the home was built. Because that home with that fire hazard or that electrical hazard or that safety hazard was built to code. 
back then. But now, a child can fatally fall through the guard. As a home inspector, I have an opportunity to help my clients. And I'm going to comment upon observations without any regard to when the house was built. Okay, here's my inspection report. We'll go through this. It's been two hours. The class has been going on for two hours. I really appreciate it. Let's get through the inspection report. I wanted to share the actual inspection report that I wrote. So here's what it looks like. I, th I throw in as many pictures as I can. The pictures that I do throw in are like, if the system is really good, I'll put in like three or six or nine pictures of good pictures. But if there's a problem, I'm definitely putting a picture in there. I might skip over if a bathroom is okay. I might not put any bathroom pictures in there. But if there are defects in the bathroom, I'm putting those pictures in there. A picture is supposed to help me communicate the most important things. And the most important things, frankly, are the problems. So if there's a problem, I'm going to try to attach a picture to the narrative or group of sentences that describes the problem in my report so that the picture helps make things clearer to understand. Right? My report should be easy to read and clear to understand. So remember the remember the the metal roof and remember this, yep. There's the chimney stack, all the cracks and the flashing. There's the interior flue liner holes. There's the fireplace chimney, there's a creosote. So I got those pictures in there for sure. There's the sump pump discharge, you got to maintain that. A few things like ground faults, right? The steps, remember the steps, missing handrail for the first few steps. And there's the crack. So like, you know, there's minor things like this one. There's major things like GFCIs, right? There's the garage. Correction is recommended. No GFCI protection. There's the heating system. Here's three pictures in a row. And then components, like here's the pictures of the system and now. I take pictures of the components. There's the thermostat. There's the shut-off switch. There's the burner. There's the burner chamber. You got to monitor that. There's the circulating pump. There's the damper on the flue connection. There's the other expansion tank and the service record and the pressure and the tank, oil fill tank. And there's the um, correction with the, the vent pipe, right? The fill pipe is way too, the, the vent pipe isn't high enough, essentially. And there's a lot of other things, and I take a picture of it. There's a dirty air filter. No recent service. Every heating and cooling system should be serviced and cleaned every year. If I don't see a, a recent service tag, I'll make a recommendation to get it serviced and cleaned. And there's the water coming in, and then domestic coil, and we need to install a, a valve, a mixing valve, in order to reduce the temperature of the scalding hot water coming out of the boiler. There's the electrical hazard there, with the overhead service conductors. There's the basement. Oh, I did put the ham in the, in the picture. I usually don't do that. And then uh, there's the sump pump. There's the lowest level information, upper level information. There's the attic. There's some water penetration in the past. And electrical wires. The bathroom fan doesn't exhaust outside, missing insulation, and the door itself. And then the bathrooms, i just skip over things. Drain stopper wasn't working for me. And the kitchen downstairs has that clothes washer draining into the sink. Smoke detectors. And then there's some illustrations from InterNACHI's gallery of illustrations. So if you wanted to have a gallery of illustrations, it's right there. So this is really nice. And these are downloadable to help you explain what you are observing. Additional information. Just overwhelm your clients with information that's of value to them. It's an infrared camera there. It's what a tankless coil is in the boiler to make hot water. Air conditioner. And there's a sump pump. And talking about the floor joists. And there's a report conclusion. And I re remind my clients that can't see through walls and that I should come to the pre-closing walkthrough. That'd be really good. And then I leave a letter for the 
occupant or the seller, the owner, saying we wore indoor only shoes essentially and we put everything back. And that's it. Uh, I want to thank you for the webinar. It was a lot of fun. And I um, hope you had fun during the webinar. And these URLs, let me share these URLs with you one more time. They're really important. So we've got natcha.org slash contact. Remember I talked about the key to success in business is to delegate to someone else who can do things for you. Well, there's 28 people that work at Internachi and they all work for you. I'm one of them. You can contact me anytime. I'm on the contact page and I'll help you out as much as possible. There are the free webinars. That's natcha.org slash webinars. And there's everything you need. 15 steps to success at natcha.org slash everything. So I put those three URLs for you. Those are the most important URLs. Contact, webinars, and everything. Natcha.org slash contact, natcha.org slash webinars, natcha.org slash everything. And I want to thank you. That was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Stay safe out there. If you want to become a home inspector and need help, feel free to reach out to our resources at Internachi. It's been um, a pleasure. Stay safe. And I'll see you on the next inspection. I'm Ben Gromico from Internachi. Bye.